Welcome to the SharePoint Framework and JavaScript Special Interest Group Biweekly Sync. It is October 10th, 2019. The year is flying by. I remember introducing the year uh, like it was yesterday. So our agenda for today's call is going to be the uh, latest update for SharePoint Framework. I almost said the last update on SharePoint Framework, which isn't right at all. Uh, and then we've got our patterns and practices standard update. So we'll go over PMPJS, the CLI, the reusable controls, and as well the Yeoman generator. And then we've got three great demos today. David Warner, uh, a quick demo on uh, getting started with doing GitHub contributions. Akash, he has two great React demos uh, on uh, the first on uh, identifying flows. And then a really cool uh, page navigator control. So excited to see that. And then Stefan has a bot framework uh, V4 uh, example of how to work with the new bot framework. So excited to see that as well. And that's an, uh, an extension or a, uh, of a previous uh, sample. So excited to see how that's going to work uh, with the latest bot framework uh, changes. So moving right along, uh, often we get asked for opportunities to, to participate in uh, the patterns and practices or the JavaScript special interest group. Uh, to participate in this call, we'd love, love, love to have you demo uh, anything SharePoint Framework, so web part, application customizer, something around provisioning, really anything around SharePoint Framework and the stuff you might create uh, in that space. And then as well, we'd love to see the demos uh, around anything in the at PNP uh, suite of things. So that could be PNPGS, the CLI, reusable trolls, and of course the Yeoman generator. And those work great uh, in conjunction with your SPFX demos. So love to see those things uh, being used together. And it really, uh, I keep saying it, I think it's one of the more valuable parts of the call uh, for all of us, uh, all of us collectively, the community to see what folks are working on uh, out there with their customers and their, their uh, companies. Because I know uh, for me and not being in the field as much as I used to be, uh, it's really exciting to see the stuff people are building and it gives us ideas on you know things we can do within PNP to help out uh, a little bit more with what you all are doing. So do reach out to myself or VESA. Great way is just uh, on Twitter DM or something like that. Uh, reach out to us. Uh, and let us know you want a demo. We'll get you on the schedule. Uh, it's not always going to be immediately like the next week. Uh, we are sometimes booked out a couple months, but we will get you on the schedule and would love to have you uh, do your demos. Uh, as well, always welcome to contribute on GitHub. So contributing can take a couple of different forms. You can report issues to us, which is always very much appreciated. Uh, submitting pull requests. Uh, so across all of our projects, uh, all of the at PNP projects, we absolutely welcome and encourage pull requests. So whether that's fixing a bug or adding some new functionality, uh, definitely uh, encourage you to get involved that way as well. And then uh, finally, always encourage folks do, uh, if you see in the issues list uh, for any of the things, uh, somebody has a question or an issue, maybe you've run into it, or maybe you know the answer. If you could jump in and help out, comment there and give them the answer or help them out. Uh, that's a that's a big help for us because it, it makes it a lot easier for those of us on the core team. We might not always uh, have the time or or uh, get around to responding to all those questions. Uh, so if, if, if you happen to see a question you know the answer to, that's a great way to contribute as well to help out other folks in the community uh, with their questions and their issues. And then finally, of course, we love to hear feedback uh, from everybody on all the things we're doing. So how are these calls going? What other documentation needs are there? Where can we help? What other uh, functionality can we provide or other projects or, or uh, features might be helpful for you in the work you're doing? And then, of course, positive feedback is OK. It's good for us to know what we're doing well, and we can do a little bit more of that uh, as well. So thank you all for uh, all your contributions and all your feedback. Uh, quick reminders on our links. AKA.MS SPDev docs is all of your SharePoint development documentation. Uh, whether you are getting started on SharePoint framework, you still are working within uh, the old, uh, not old, the still current, but the app model, uh, any of those things. And even if you're on premises, uh, all of the SharePoint developer documentation is rolling up under that URL. So definitely check that out. We've got the SPDev videos. We'll take you to our YouTube channel where we have. Uh, Lots of different videos, including the recordings of these calls, but as well, you've got tutorials on getting started with SharePoint Framework, getting started with provisioning, uh, getting started with PNPJS, lots of other topics uh, across the entire at PNP space. Uh, so definitely check those out. Lots of great tutorials, lots of great content. 
Uh, some of it short form, some of it long form. So if you have a quick, you know, you, it kind of fills uh, the needs uh, just for getting started. And then as well, uh, spdev-issues, that is your place to report any uh, product issues with SharePoint or with uh, uh, SharePoint framework. Uh, those can go to that issues list. And then, of course, any uh, issues you find within the at PNP uh, resources should be reported to their appropriate issues list. So spdev-issues is for SharePoint product and SPFX issues. And then all the various uh, at PNP uh, lists are for those libraries issues. And with that, I'll turn things over to Vesa. So uh, SharePoint framework adaption uh, definitely is growing still a lot. Uh, this is always, we, we always show the latest numbers. This is actually including already yesterday's uh, usage. Uh, so uh, the growth is absolutely out of this world. Uh, so we are seeing growing, growing, uh, growing usage. Uh, I think on Tuesday's call was said that it was 15.6 or 15.4 percent increase on the share, third party SharePoint framework usage in worldwide SharePoint online in last month. Uh, so 15.6 percent is a massive number uh, considering uh, already where we are with the overall uh, usage. So huge, huge uh, growth all the time, which is great. Uh, nothing too dramatical, and I didn't update this slide at all, actually, since the, the last uh, community call, uh, because there hasn't been actually that much new stuff. Uh, so we're looking into making the 1.10 out uh, relatively soon. Uh, with all too honestly, uh, to provide some transparency, uh, we are now prioritizing uh, a dev kitchen. So we do our, uh, we will execute a dev kitchen next week uh, with a selected group of partners and customers at Redmond, uh, where we're going to actually talk about uh, this, uh, like, how would I put it, um, fluid framework and SharePoint framework, the next uh, 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 direction where we're actually heading with the product. Uh, we'll talk about publicly more about that one in Ignite. Uh, but next week uh, is the Dev Kitchen, where we will have 57 attendees, if, I'm, if I remember the exact number, uh, and we're going to build cool stuff and, and pilot and test uh, this model. Uh, you will then see much more announcements and coverage uh, in Ignite within a, a few weeks around this topic, and we're going to obviously do live demos on all of this stuff uh, in the community course as well. Uh, the key point here is to is to understand that we are uh, further investing uh, as a Microsoft 365 or, or Office 365 in Microsoft 365 level actually on this SharePoint framework model uh, because SharePoint framework has been insanely successful um, uh, so we kind of further and extend that uh, across to other services as well like we've been discussing uh, in this community course as well. Now, the one thing which will come out uh, for sure uh, in October, so quite soon, uh, because it's a server-side change, is the capability for allocating SharePoint Framework extension areas uh, during the UI loading. So pretty soon, uh, you will see a new uh, column in the tenant-wide extension uh, list uh, in the app catalog, which can be used with a certain tactics uh, to pre-allocate, for example, 50 pixel height uh, or 60 pixel height uh, headers and footer areas uh, as part of the loading. So during load time of the page, uh, we will basically allocate uh, a certain space for the application customizer, and then when the page is completely loaded, then the, the actual JavaScript is kicking in, and that's going to then render on that allocated area. So that's basically then uh, reducing the, how would I put it, the page flickery effect, uh, which you might see right now uh, if you're an ISV or, or you've implemented application customizer. So basically the page is moving quite a lot as part of the, the loading events, and whenever the application customizer kicks in, almost like the fast thing, the last thing on the page loading, it just can move the page still. And that's not always an optimal thing, so we're now solving that at least. In a one way, uh, this will be uh, the simple way of solving things is to allocate the space, what's actually happening. It will be a, uh, there's a new property actually on the custom action uh, entry of the of the extensions, and then there will be an option to define this in the tenant-wide extension list as well. So we're looking into documenting this quite fast whenever the documentation or, or the functionality is 100% rolled, <laughs> rolled out uh, worldwide. So that's going to happen within next week or two, most likely, and then uh, we'll most likely we can, can demo this in uh, the next community call. So quick updates on the at PMP suite of stuff. 
so PNP JS version two, we are working on that uh, pretty actively, uh, aiming for an RC beta one uh, in October. I've now crossed out early October because uh, my personal work schedule has been uh, very much busier uh, than I had anticipated, which is always good. Uh, but uh, if you are interested in helping out, we still have some uh, some modules that could use some help. There's a call uh, recording you could check out, pmpjsv 2 start contributing Certainly check that out. That's a great way to find out how to get involved and help us uh, get uh, that first beta out the door. And then uh, just a reminder, we're going to move the graph library stuff over as is. We're not going to update the docs or tests, um, but we have uh, updated it to work with the V2 uh, core. So uh, with the import, the selective imports and invocable functionality. So that is uh, uh, gonna move over as is for uh, reasons. And then we will have a release on October 11th. That's this Friday of some updates for V1. Uh, we did miss a release uh, last month, uh, again, due to me being just super busy, uh, but we've got, I went through and got a bunch of bug fixes and uh, enhancements that were sitting in the issues list for a while, got those in. We'll have that release on October 11th. So if there's anything you wanna try and get submitted uh, prior to the release, we will do the release Friday. So uh, I would ask, uh, for you to get those in uh, shortly. Uh, httpmp.github.io slash pmpjs for the docs. Hashtag pmpjs on Twitter. You can always follow me uh, at Mediocre Bowler on Twitter. Uh, and David brought up a good thing uh, that I should mention. We did uh, for the first time in September across 4 billion requests uh, in the month of, uh, uh, in a month for pmpjs. So really uh, kind of amazing uh, milestone there and really a testament to all the great work uh, all of you are doing with the library out there with your customers uh, and uh, your companies to uh, really support that and get it out there. And uh, it's it's really phenomenal to see the growth. And it's so much growth, we're finally getting uh, a little bit of positive traction uh, internally on getting some more support, uh, formal support uh, around the libraries. So excited to see that. And thank you uh, to all of you. So a really great milestone uh, there. And we should, uh, we'll, we'll in November be celebrating a couple different milestones. So we'll have some updates uh, there. Uh, Office 365 CLI version two is out. There's a new beta 2.2 uh, with uh, support for retrieving Yammer networks, enabling features and uh, retrieving Teams message replies. So you can always install the latest beta, npm install-g uh, at PNP Office 365-CLI at next, and that will give you whatever the latest functionality is. Remember that's a, a beta. I mean, the betas are usually pretty solid for the CLI, but anytime you're installing a beta, understand it might have a few couple of things. And of course, if you have issues, you could always uh, report those to the issues list. But the CLI is a great cross-platform tool uh, to use when managing uh, your your SharePoint, your Azure, uh, various other uh, Office 365 capabilities uh, are there, and it's it's really great, especially if you're not able to use PowerShell or don't want to use PowerShell. Uh, it's a really powerful solution for scripting out deployments and doing uh, other uh, administrative uh, or development type tasks. AKMS Office 365 CLI for more information. Hashtag Office 365 CLI on Twitter. There is as well a Gitter channel, uh, gitter.im slash Office 365 CLI. So definitely check that out and get started with the CLI if you haven't already. Updates on the reusable controls. Uh, React controls beta 115 is out. Uh, latest controls, file picker, grid layout, and carousel, plus numerous fixes and enhancements. Uh, special thanks to our contributors in alphabetical order. Uh, Amortzel, Hugo, Robert, uh, PFC2K8. Wow, man, great name. Uh, Peter, Alex, uh, Lewis and Eric. So thanks folks for contributing to the latest releases. Really appreciate that. And I know there's been a lot of great contributors to the controls as there have been for all of our libraries. So thank you to everybody again. Uh, more information on, uh, yes. Yep. Sorry, sorry for jumping on no, this one. Please. So I, no, I just wanted to, um, in the, in the, sorry, <laughs> in the, in the latest SharePoint Dev Weekly, we, we actually had a good discussion with Waldeck around this one as well. So just a reminder for everybody, please remember to update your GitHub profiles uh, to use your name and maybe reference, for example, your Twitter account if you if you want to have that one mentioned or making sure that people know who you are. So uh, like I said, BFC2K8, uh, um, you can be absolutely anonymous and keep on 
using that kind of an alias, but that means that we can't really acknowledge the awesomeness what these people are doing. So there is somebody behind of that alias, but we don't know who he is or she is. So it would be great if she or he can actually then open up the profile slightly so we can actually call out the name and potential company and all of that stuff, what people are doing. Right, Patrick? Yes. <laughs> cool. I agree. That was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was on the script. Excellent. <laughs> Let's uh... continue. So more information on the controls. Uh, there's two sets of controls. So the first one there, are the property controls. Those are controls designed to be used in, for example, the edit pane of your SharePoint framework web parts and help you uh, create a very rich editing experience. So uh, it gives you out of the box, styled with Office UI fabric, a set of React controls that will allow you to do people picker, list picking, uh, color picker, uh, file picker. There's a whole bunch of great controls there. Um, save you a ton of time uh, for providing a rich editing experience in your SharePoint framework web parts. And the other set of controls are the controls React, which are designed to be used more in the body of either your web parts or could be appropriate as well in an application customizer. So you can check uh, those out. Again, save you a ton of time, give you a nice out of the box look um, and really shorten your development cycles to get a very rich experience for your users. So be sure to check out the controls as well. And then we've got updates for the Yeoman generator. Uh, we're still at one, not still at, we're at 110 uh, released. Uh, that is uh, no change from the last updates, but uh, just a reminder, had major upgrades uh, for Handlebars.js, support for Handlebar.js partials and helpers, upgrades to Vue.js support, and then Angular.js bundling updates. Uh, include support for all of those different things there in that list. I don't need to read them all to you. I think you could all read. But installing the latest version via npm, npm install dash g at pmp slash generator dash spfx. Link there to the documentation, aka dot mspnp generator. And then as well, there's a Gitter channel. If you haven't used the generator, generator is a great uh, extension on the out-of-the-box Microsoft generator. So you're going to get a quote-unquote standard SharePoint framework project when you use the uh, PNP open source generator, but you're going to have a whole set of additional options and features that can come uh, pre-installed or pre-configured into your new SharePoint framework project, such as using things like handlebars and view, having PNP JS or the reusable controls or the CLI already uh, installed in your project, and then a lot of other great features around testing and linting and other support like that. So it's it's a really great extension. And it's a really uh, excellent way to create a new SharePoint framework project uh, from scratch, uh, but ending up with a lot of stuff that you normally in the past would have to configure for yourself on the out of the box generator. So be sure to check that out. Uh, another great tool in the at PNP toolkit. So uh, very excited to see that grow. And again, another place we've seen a lot of Wonderful contributions from folks uh, across the community. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody uh, for all your contributions uh, across the community. And speaking of contributions, a great way to contribute is through a demo. So we're going to start with some demos right now. Look at that transition. That's just A-plus stuff. Uh, David Warner, if you are ready to go, uh, if you want to take over presenting, uh, you've got a, a demo on quick demo on GitHub contributions. So about uh, a couple minutes on that. Yes, Take thank it you, away. Sir. Okay, all right, so today we're talking about a new sharing is caring initiative, uh, essentially the patterns and practices hands-on guidance for contributions. So wanted to start out with uh, looking at the slide that was just debuted from VESA on Tuesday. Now this is awesome, all these contributions, and as small as this font is, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, and I'm gonna guess that VESA would love nothing more than to be forced to create two or more of these slides because there are so many contributions. But we also know that that sort of growth probably isn't going to happen with just enough positive encouragement in all the world because there are certain technical challenges, right, that come with the GitHub contribution process. I'm also going to guess that there's probably someone on this call right now that would like to contribute, uh, but maybe has felt a little intimidated or unsure or unaware of the steps needed to make those contributions. And knowing that they're all publicly available when you make them, uh, they might be afraid they're going to make a mistake. So we're going to help remove those fears and provide experience starting with a sharing is caring initiative. Uh, and we're going to start with some cleaner documentation. So let's go ahead and look at that. 
So you'll notice that this documentation has been updated. It's more aligned with some that we see in the React components, uh, PNPJS, et cetera. So it should be a little easier to start consuming. It's not so GitHub-y when, when you get there. Um, now, there's been some fair questions and perspective uh, from the community around if someone is afraid to use GitHub, how is creating a GitHub repo going to help them? <laughs> uh, Mark Anderson had a fantastic example of this. He had said, uh, I remember back when I got a VCR, I think we're all probably old enough to know what a VCR is. Uh, I didn't know how to use my VCR, but with my VCR came an actual VHS tape that had instructions on how to use the VCR but I didn't know how to use a VCR, so what good did the tape do, right? Huge fail on the part of the VCR company. But imagine if the VCR company provided a person that helped train you live with hands-on guidance. And, and that's really what the goal of the Sharing and Caring, Sharing is Caring initiative is. It's not just a repo for you to come read another set of instructions. Nope, the repo is a landing spot and also a sandbox that will uh, help connect everyone in the community that wants to contribute to scheduled sessions that you can register to attend, and it's going to provide live hands-on guidance, and it's going to walk you through the contribution process every step of the way so that we that way we can remove any of the fears that you may have in that process and equip you with the experience and the confidence and the power to feel like you can contribute without feeling like you're going to make a mistake or, or do something wrong. So let's uh, start by looking through just a quick uh, glance at what is available. This is the landing page, and I'll provide a short URL that we've got created for it um, at the end of the demo. Uh, but it comes and it talks about the guidance and assistance, right? And and so we want to look at the uh, specifically the guidance opportunities. And you can get there by clicking on that link, or you can go to the contribution guidance. Uh, and that's going to take you to a few different ideas that we started out with. Now, let's go through them just briefly. The first is for first-time PNP contributors, and that's really where the biggest hurdle usually is. If you've never done it and you land on a GitHub page, it can be a little intimidating. So in this case, we're going to provide you no experience required, and all you need is your browser and a GitHub account. And we'll walk you through creating live on a call together, uh, creating a, a GitHub pull request. And that just means creating an update and submitting the change. And in this case, for first-time contributors, usually the quickest and easiest way to do that is updating the documentation. Well, even if you are comfortable with updating the documentation, you may be uncomfortable with going in and making a change to one of the live um, dev docs, right, docs.microsoft.com um, documents, simply because you're not sure if you're going to make a mistake. Uh, what the repo, and this is the beauty of the sharing is caring repo, is we will pre-create documents that need to be updated. And so you're in a safe zone to be able to make those updates during the session. And at the end of the session, that will actually count towards your first PNP contribution. So how awesome is that? And, and you'll get to experience it from all the way beginning to end. Uh, and so the way you would start out to register is you'll notice down here at the bottom, there is a contribution registration form link. And you would just click that. I'll open it here in a new tab. And it's really lightweight. Uh, you know, it just asks for your name, email, and GitHub account profile name so that we can kind of capture that in advance. And that helps us preset some of the content that will be available there during the session. Um, we're, we're trying to determine the best time. We are a global community, so we can't just simply say, despite Vess's best efforts to have a single time zone, uh, <laughs> it doesn't fit and it doesn't work. So we're trying to find whether or not we need additional sessions, right? If there's additional sessions where maybe we need to meet in mornings or evenings or both uh, to meet everybody's requirements and, and requests to be able to take advantage of this opportunity, uh, then we'll definitely do that. Um, now, that's not just it, right? So there are going to be additional opportunities. You may say, hey, that's great. I want to start with the documentation. And I've walked through people that have started there. And they said, this is awesome. I want to do more, though. Uh, I've got an idea for a code contribution. So we're going to be setting up additional sessions around being able to, if you've got a fantastic sample you want to submit but not sure how, it's a little more complex than simply updating a piece of document, uh, then we're going to create sessions for that. And you know, even beyond that, you may say, I I'm a developer, but I don't really have any of my own samples. Well, we also want to set up where you can take a look at the samples that are already in the repo. And a lot of them get outdated, and that's understandable. It's community driven. We get busy, we submit a sample, and then we move on. Uh, but there is a great way to help the community by upgrading those with the Office 365 CLI. Uh, and so that'll be another one, another session that we'll be creating uh, that'll walk you through through that process. 
All right. So those are the three. If you have an idea around uh, additional sessions that might be of value or you want to brainstorm around it, definitely reach out and, and let us know. Um, so let me go back to the slides here. Now, where can you put this to use, right? We talked about dev docs. So that's one of the first easiest uh, low hanging fruit that we can help walk you through. Uh, and so we'll we'll show you that in the first in the first uh, contributor session if you sign up for that. Uh, there's also the usage docs. So Mark Anderson has been really working hard on putting together the repo for usage docs. Uh, again, this goes in line with what you see here on on the dev docs. You know, you you'll be able to take that experience and parlay it down into the dev docs and that that will really help the community as well uh, we had talked about the spfx sample so hugo bernier had created that amazing um uh, interactive uh gallery of the web parts that are easier to find and one of those ways that you can find web parts there is by looking at versions so it makes it really easy to find the older versions that might need to be updated and bam that's a contribution right so there's three takeaways here. First of all, you're not alone. Our community success is based upon community support. And that doesn't just mean encouraging people to contribute and then leaving them on their, uh, on the, on, by themselves alone to do that. We really have a responsibility to help one another. And this is one of the first ways that we're looking to do that. Um, it's more than just GitHub. Right. So we're not just looking, as you could see with the CLI session, this is not just about, hey, we're going to give you experience with submitting stuff that you need to go create on your own in a bubble uh, and then submit it to GitHub. You, you saw that that provides you access on how to submit it using GitHub, but also it exposes you to amazing other tools like the CLI. That project upgrade command is amazing and super powerful and not hard to use, and it'll give you exposure to code that's out there. Uh, it'll allow you to upgrade it and allow you to resubmit it back in. Uh, and so check out that short link, sharing is caring, aka.ms forward slash sharing is caring. And then feel free to reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions. I'm always happy to help. Uh, and and love the the interaction and we're all in this together. So one last thing uh, You may have noticed the little teaser around the PNP contribution challenge rewards, right? So I've uh, been working with Vess on this. We're still working on it, right? You get some swag. You get some swag Everybody gets some swag. We're everybody wants a little swag and, and we all love to see our names in the bright lights of that contribution slide on the monthly call love to see our company name up there uh, but let's face it, we love swag a little more. So uh, this is coming soon. Nothing set yet in stone, but uh, it's an exciting opportunity. Uh, maybe some stickers or some mugs or something like that. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. It's I think this is going to be a really exciting way to to help encourage and and provide some giving back to the community in a way that uh, hasn't happened yet. So hope you guys want to get involved. Feel free to reach out again, aka.ms. Sharing is caring. And thanks for the time. Great. Thanks, David, uh, for that. Appreciate that. Uh, Akash, if you are uh, on the call and ready to go, we're not going to try and switch back to the slides. If you want to just try and take over uh, presenting. Uh, but really excited to see uh, that initiative uh, that David was talking about. Uh, hopefully that will help uh, folks who want to contribute but aren't quite sure how to get involved. So there you are. Akash, how are you today? Hi, Patrick. I'm good. So Great. just to start with a small introduction. So hello, everyone. My name is Akash Bhardwaj. So I work as an Office 365 developer at HCL Technologies. So I have two samples that I would be showing today. So that I recently contributed to the SPFX web parts uh, GitHub repo. So the first one is called the React page navigator. So I'm going to start with this. So recently this new feature was introduced for the modern pages. So wherein any of the heading tags that we add in the text web parts. So they automatically get an anchor tag associated with them. Uh, like I have this introduction. So if I just hover over to, uh, next to it, so I get this uh, hashtag introduction appended to the page URL. So clicking on this would directly take me to uh, that heading so that I won't have to uh, manually scroll to go to that link. So the a common scenario that I thought of uh, could be around this feature was to have a list of all such headings on the page so that it can act as a table of contents web part and the users can just simply uh, see what all content is there on the page and clicking on each of those links would uh, directly take them to that section. 
So this is what I built my web part around. So let me just show how it works. So here I add this vertical section, another cool new feature added for modern pages. So and therein I find and add my uh, page navigator web part. So here you can see, so this automatically lists all these headings uh, as navigation links so that clicking on each of these links would take me to that section of the page. So it's uh, pretty simple to use web parts. Uh, uh, there isn't any uh, property that you need to configure to start using it. So let me just remove this and refresh my page. So here if I click on this uh, purpose link, just a second. OK, so I click on this uh, criteria link, so it takes me to this page. And similarly, I can uh, I just simply need to click on this uh, uh, whatever navigation link I have, and it would uh, take me to that section of the page. So this was what the basic uh, functionality of the web part is. So let me jump over to the code for this. So here I have my main web part .ts file. So in the on init method, I'm calling this get anchor links method of the SP service class. So let me show this. Uh, so this is my method that would uh, return an array of the type I nav link that I can sing, uh, simply use to uh, populate my Office UI Fabric React nav component. So what I'm doing is, first of all, I'm getting the page ID on for the page on which this web part is added. And using that page ID, then I'm calling the uh, site pages REST API to get all the info about that page. So once I have that, then I'm using this canvas content uh, one property that basically has all the uh, information about all the web parts that are added on the page. So once I have that, then I'm traversing through each of these web parts and finding which uh, which of these web parts are actually text web parts that I'm doing by checking if this uh, inner HTML property exists for that web part. So once I have that, then I'm just using some basic regex operation to um, get the value of uh, uh, my heading tags and their URL as well here. So, and once I have all these URLs, so after that I'm uh, making some checks to see whether this, uh, uh, whether the navigation link that I have, so whether it should be uh, promoted as a main link of, in the web part or as a sublink to the previous, um, to the previous link that we saw, because uh, in, you can see here like uh, this scope that we have. So this is currently a uh, heading of the type H2. So it's listed as a sublink of this main H1 introduction uh, heading. So these anchor tags that we see, they are currently supported for all the H1, H2, and H3 tags. So in this section, I'm just uh, uh, checking that sorting order so that uh, all my navigation links are uh, sorted and uh, structured correctly. So once I have traversed through all these web parts and all these uh, uh, anchor tags. So then I simply return this uh, um, this array of inav link. So once I have this uh, value here in this this dot anchor links, so then I simply pass that as a prop to my React component, and this is the one. So herein I'm simply using the Fabric React nav component. I'm just uh, um, uh, uh, specifying these links as the uh, as the links for this uh, component so that uh, these get list rendered correctly and other than this uh, just the selected key and on link click methods i'm using so that my current navigation link gets highlighted whenever we click on it so any questions around this or shall i proceed to the um, next sample that i have uh, I think there might be a couple of questions in the window, but if you just want to move ahead and then you can do questions at the end might be uh, the better way to, to move forward. Sure. Okay, so moving on to the next sample. Uh, so this one is called the React Check Flows. So this one was built uh, as kind of an admin utility. 
so that uh, site owners or admins can quickly see uh, whether there are any instances of Microsoft Flow attached to any list or library in the site, because I think that feature can come handy uh, from a maintenance point of view, or let's say when you are um, uh, replicating any list on a different site or migrating. So in that case, you might want to check if there are any flows attached to the list that you should also uh, copy to the new site. So uh, let me just show how it works. So I edit my page. I search for this uh, checklist flows web part. So here I can just uh, add a configurable web part title for this. Let me save the page. Uh, so here you see uh, this drop down called select list. So this uh, shows me all the lists that are existing in my current site collection. So I select the site pages list. So here and I can I get a detailed list about some basic information about the flows that are attached to this list. Like I have the flow name, flow trigger, flow share type, whether it's a my flow or a team flow, and then a go to flow link. So clicking on which would take me to uh, that flow details page in Microsoft Flow. So here I can obviously get uh, more info about it and maybe even edit it. So uh, I can select any list here. So if there are any flows attached to it, it will simply show up here. And if not, then it would just uh, give a message that there are no flows associated with this list. So one thing I'd like to share for this is that uh, this uh, this web part only lists the flows that are shared with the uh, current user. So whether they would have to be created by him or her as my flows, or they would have to be shared as team flows with them. So only those flows would be shown here. And also they must be residing in the uh, your default environment. So any flows created by other users not shared or flows in other environments, they won't be listed here. So let me jump over to the code for this. So this is my main webpart TS file. So here in I'm um, I'm using this sp.web.lists to get to all the uh, lists in my site. So I'm getting their title and entity type name. So once I have this, uh, then I'm just uh, 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 assigning its value to this this dot list options. So this uh, variable I am passing as a prop to my React component along with some other properties that are I think basically used uh, just for that configurable web part title. So here in my React component, if I look at the render method, so first of all, there is this uh, React reusable control for web part title. Then I have my dropdown the, for select list. So in the on, so in the option for the drop down options, I have this uh, props dot list options that I pass from my web part file, and then on change I'm calling this method uh, list selected. So herein I'm actually constructing the URL for this list, and uh, once I have that or for the list or library, and once I have that, so then I'm passing it to this method get list flows. So in this method, I am using this uh, mm, sync flow instances re, uh, REST API. So I'm passing the URL for the list. And so this uh, uh, returns me some information about uh, what flows are attached to this list. So once I have this info, so then this is an important part like uh, the val dot synchronization data. So this is my uh, uh, main property that uh, so I'm also going to show the structure for how this for how this um, like what values this property will this property. So here I see it has one property for value. It is an array. So this is the error that would uh, array that would uh, contain the list of all flows. So this information that you see here, this was for the site pages, the one that had uh, three flows attached to it. So in the value array, so we have all the info about each of these flows. For example, here I have the display name, and then I have the sharing type, whether it's author or co-author, 
and then uh, i guess in the definition summary yes here in the triggers i get what is the trigger like when would this flow be triggered so this one is for on updated file items and i have this id as well so this i am using to uh, construct the go to flow url so once i have this uh, info the synchronization dot value so then i'm traversing through each of these array elements and then uh, i'm actually pushing it to pushing the all the required info to another array of type i flow details so this is a, an interface that i have uh, created for storing this uh, storing all the uh, information around each of these flows so like i have this display name and then trigger and this is the flow url and the shared type whether it would be uh, team flow or mi flow so once i have all these uh, uh, this information in place so then i'm calling the set state uh, method to add it to this flow item state variable and then in my details list uh, component here and i am actually passing the this this dot state dot flow items as the items so that uh, uh, it uh, renders all the flow information correctly and other than this i am also using this uh, cool shimmer control so that uh, renders some placeholder data while my actual data is being loaded so just a way to keep uh, the user engaged like the um, uh, content is still being loaded so this is all from the code i think so i think we can start uh, having the questions now yeah there's a few there in the window uh, but i think in the interest of time if you can answer them in the chat window that would be uh best and we can move on to uh stefan's demo if he is on the call and ready to go but really interesting stuff and great to see the code for both of those controls to see how you're doing that um, and both of those samples uh, are available. It looks like uh, David just posted the links there in the chat. Uh, both of those are available. Uh, definitely check those out. They show some great techniques uh, for doing uh, different things in React, but also different things with working with flows and auth and uh, so forth. So, and even a little uh, PMPJS in there. So great to see, great work on that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Akash, to see those. And Stefan, if you're on the call and ready yeah. to take over. Uh, so quick intro uh, about myself. My name is Stefan. Uh, I'm based in uh, Graz, Austria. I work for a company called Solvion and I'm a, and I'm a technical lead there. Um, besides that, I'm an MVP for artificial intelligence. I'm focusing around the Microsoft Bot Framework and the whole conversational AI platform. Uh, and that's why I actually did this uh, sample on integrating a bot within a SharePoint framework uh, or basically the SharePoint environment. Um, and this was actually my first sample I submitted. So um, good to know that David has pushed out some some contribution guidelines uh, as I now want to start uh, contributing more and more into the PMP stuff. So first of all, uh, for any one of you who doesn't know what actually Microsoft is offering in terms of conversational AI and bots, um, there's a pretty decent SDK out there, which is called the Microsoft Bot Framework, um, which is basically designed to um, have you being able to, to uh, develop bots, um, no matter if it's on the .NET stack or JavaScript or even Java or Python is available these days. Um, so you could basically uh, use that SDK to write your bot, um, do the whole development uh, stuff locally on your machine. And if you say you're ready to go and you want to push your bot out to, to the world, uh, you can host it on Azure, of course. So there's a managed uh, bot service called the Azure Bot Service, um, which basically does the whole connection to the channels like Teams, Slack, Facebook Messenger, and so on for you. Um, so the cool thing is you basically write your bot, bot code once and it runs everywhere no matter where which channel you want to, to target um, on top of that uh, you got to use some services uh, for for uh, integrating intelligence into your bot because the bot itself is not that not that intelligent at all uh, the intelligence comes by uh, the thing called cognitive services so they're uh, i guess they're more than 
20 or almost 30 cognitive services out there which you could use in the various categories for various use cases like vision, language understanding, speech, and so on. Um, and on top of that, Microsoft actually uh, is now starting to um, push out templates which you can uh, basically use to as a starting point for various use cases like an HR template for a HR bot, a customer care template, and so on. Um, so what we also have uh, in the in the bot ecosystem, similar to to the PMP um, thing, is a bot builder community. So if you if any one of you is interested in doing like bot stuff, um, reach out to us. Um, we have some some GitHub repos out there which you can contribute to. Um, what is actually a, a bot uh, and how does it work? So if any one of you um, has ever built a bot um, or, or worked with the Microsoft uh, solutions out there, um, it's basically, or, or the, the vision is basically to have a virtual assistant, uh, which is capable of adding value to various user processes. So um, in some kinds, it should be able to understand speech, uh, some use cases should um, be able to uh, have a bot which is capable of answering questions and answers or um, commonly uh, asked questions and FAQ stuff. Um, and what you basically need to think about always when, when developing bots is, first of all, um, which user input types do I want to support? Should it be a text-only bot? These days, um, if we if we as humans um, have a conversation with another human being, we don't actually use text only, but we work with links, we work with images, we work with emojis. So you should also think about if your bot should understand that these kind of, of input types and, and attachment types as well. Um, you want to think about your channels you want to you want to deploy your bot to. Um, so should it be a Teams bot? Should it be like a Amazon Alexa skill type of bot, um, and therefore you need to have like various services um, put into your bot for speech understanding or for um, special teams things uh, like messaging extensions and so on. And of course, um, your bot is not only um, be able to run on, on smartphones and on, on the browser, um, you can deploy your bot anywhere you want to. So you can, as I said, write an Amazon Alexa skill with the bot framework, you could do the same for Cortana. Um, you can even push your bot into uh, your your vehicle, your car, if you want to, um, and talk to your bot in your car. And the next thing you always have to keep in mind um, is does the bot uh, need to connect to web knowledge sources? Of course it can because it's just a web application. You run somewhere in Azure or in your uh, premises on your data center or wherever, so you can reach out to them. And Microsoft actually um, is kind of going the same way as Amazon does with its Alexa, so you can build skills. Um, and those are the things um, you can reuse. So it's basically comparable to the reusable components, um, if you will. So you basically just develop your bot and then you develop the skills and plug the skills into your bot and you can reuse them across different bots um, to make the user interaction and the user experience even greater. And of course, um, the Microsoft stack is natively integrated, so you can work with the graph natively. You can do all the authentication stuff with Azure AD um, right from your bot. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, in terms of channel support, um, there are more than 20 channels supported right now. Um, so as you can see, and as I mentioned here, not only Microsoft ones, but also third party channels are supported. Um, and from from the sample perspective I did, um, I focused around the web chat uh, channel and the, the direct line channel. So those are basically um, the pre-built channels you can use to offer like a web chat uh, window for your bot, which you can host on, let's say, your web page or wherever. Um, and this pretty much looks like this out of the box. So this is also out, open source out there on GitHub. So you can check that out. Um, you can clone the repo, you can customize it, um, you can integrate it with JavaScript, or if you want, and as, as I did it as well in the sample, integrated with, uh, integrated with React. So um, there's the bot framework dash web chat uh, MPM um, module you can use, um, which basically offers you the React component um, you could use uh, for rendering the web chat as a React component. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, in terms of customizations, that's pretty 
um, pretty basic. So you have all black and white uh, out there. Of course, um, what what the web chat component uh, offers you is to change various colors, change the sizes, of course, even um, use your own CSS styles. Um, and uh, with the React component, you can do even more. So you can add custom render activities. Um, you can add uh, new UI components if you want to. Uh, and you can basically recompose the whole UI to fit your needs. Um, and the sample I did was based on a sample which was already out there. So um, Bob Chairman, uh, Gary Pretty, and the team did a good job in, in uh, kicking out the sample, for, which was actually using the bot framework version 3. Um, so version 3 was used uh, one and a half years ago, um, and one and a half years ago version 4 um, got, uh, got GA, I guess, roughly at that time frame. Um, and the V3 version of the web chat uh, offered rather rather basic capabilities in terms of um, customizations and so on. Uh, so back then um, you only had like text support and stuff and the, the SPFX uh, web part sample, um, which was out there also just had that text support. And when you do uh, modern bots and when you, when you develop modern bots, you don't want to use text only, but you want to use like adaptive cards you want to use rich attachments, you want to use images, videos, links, and stuff like that. Uh, and they should be natively rendered within the, the web chat window. So I thought it uh, would be a pretty cool idea to upgrade the sample and to, to integrate it with the version 4. Um, and that's basically what I did. So um, let's jump on to the code, actually. Um, as I said, I'm using the, um, I'm using the React component um, from the bot framework. Um, I have here some uh, properties I uh, define and I, which basically users can uh, configure in the property pane ranging from the direct line secret. So direct line secret is the secret we use to connect the web part to the bot. So the web part actually or the React uh, component actually knows whom to talk to and where the bot is deployed. Um, and when you do it, when you uh, add a bot in the Azure portal, you always get a direct line secret. So that's the secret you use to communicate from the bot with any other service or instance uh, natively via the direct line protocol. Um, what we also can change is like text colors, uh, background colors. Um, we can uh, set some initials for the bot and the users. Um, or we can also set some images for the bot and the users um, and so on. So uh, this basically, that's basically it from, from the property side uh, and the web part side or direct uh, component side is rather simple. Um, so um, what I actually did, and this is basically the whole magic which happens in there, um, is that you use the React web chat component coming from the bot framework dash web chat uh, NPM module um, you add your direct line secrets as i said this there's the unique identifier and the secret um, connecting the web part and the, the azure bot uh, and you give some some style options uh, with it um, for uh, customizing the ui and that's basically it um, and what that looks like in detail um, as i said style set options so there are a lot of um, there's, there's a lot of styling capabilities out there. Um, so you can basically recompose the whole uh, user interface and the whole React web chat component, and you can play around with the colors. You can play around with the with the height, uh, widths of images and with uh, the height and image uh, width of the uh, text boxes and so on. And you can basically get your CI, CD guidelines on top of the web chat component to make it look native wherever you want to deploy it. Um, you can even use custom fonts if you want to. If you if you don't like the Segway UI, um, you can use, uh, I don't know, Comic Sans or, or any other font if you like to make it more look like um, funny or so. Um, and yeah, that's basically it from there. So if you want to check it out, I have a blog post out there, uh, which is basically uh, just around the styles of options you have. Um, so. Let's look at it, let's look at it uh, in detail or, or, or live. So I have a, I have a site here um, and I've already added the bot rep check, bot framework chat v4 um, app to, to my site. So uh, the solution basically 
uh, offers you both. This is the version three, um, and this is the the sample I uh, published out there. Um, and if you add it, of course, it says unable to connect because I have not added the uh, direct line secret. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the direct line secret now. Um, so my bot actually runs out in Azure, uh, and this direct line secret is um, bound to my bot in Azure. Um, and that's basically it uh, for the first thing I need to to insert in there. So if the direct line secret is there, um, the connection can be established, and I can basically talk to my bot and say hi, how are you, and so on, and it will basically respond. So as you can see here, um, that's the, the the basic web chat um, UI here, black and white, not very fancy. Um, so if you wanna make it more colorful, colorful. Um, we can go ahead and just add some some colors in here. Um, the background messages from the bot. We can also go ahead and uh, add some some foreground colors. Same for user messages. Um, same for the text box. So we can customize the text box if you want to. Uh, and on the second page, we have the visuals concerning the icons or, or initials you want to use. So I'm going to go ahead, uh, and this is basically a one thing I uh, can can imagine, which can be um, a, a next release thing, um, to not uh, put in there some, some hard-coded images, but reach out to the graph. As the user is already logged in in my SharePoint site, reach out to the graph, grab the user image from the graph, and put it in there uh, as an image for for the user um, to make it more uh, appealing. Um, so if I've said anything, and I hope I didn't forget anything, let's just reload the page, right again, and see um, we have like an image for the user here. The um, message background for user messages is now light blue. The same is true for bot uh, messages, which is uh, dark blue. We have an image for the bot, and you can basically go from there um, and design the whole thing uh, how you want to, to have it designed. And of course, um, we also have support for not only text, but for, like in this case, an adaptive card, which renders here. Um, and that's pretty, pretty decent, pretty cool use case to integrate bots within your SharePoint sites. Um, and the next thing I may uh, release the couple, the next couple of weeks is to not only have this as a web part, but have this as an application customizer within your pages um, to basically have like a, a floating button somewhere on your page, which you can actually use um, to trigger the the web chat to your bot and users can still navigate on the page and can talk to the bot and then um, if they say okay uh, the bot helped me i'm finished with the conversation just click on the on the button again and it disappears so that's basically um, what's cooking from my side um, if you want to know some details about it um, i've also done a, a blog post on this or just simply check out the github repo um, where everything is um, uh, described there's even a uh, sample chatbot in there which was done by Gary Pretty so if you don't have a bot already and you don't um, have the time to to develop your own bot just use the uh, sample bot in there um, there's also some links in there which described on how to to get started with the with the bot samples so you should pretty uh, pretty uh, fast to to uh, have this sample up and running so that was about it from my side um, are there any any open questions? Uh, great stuff, Stefan. Um, I think there might be a few questions there in the chat, uh, but in the interest of time, uh, we could go ahead and uh, review those from the chat. I'm going to get the slide deck sure, sure. uploaded again. But great stuff. Really interesting uh, demo again. Uh, really fascinating stuff all through today. So Stefan, with a great demo uh, there on the bot builder stuff, would really amazing to see the slick integrations there. Uh, a cache, two great web parts uh, to see uh, two different pieces of functionality and some great backup code. And then, of course, David had a great presentation there on getting started with uh, contributing and how you can get some help uh, with contributing. So really awesome demos today. You can see why I'm always a big fan of the demos. Thanks to all three of you again. Really fantastic stuff. Our next SPFX JS meeting is going to be October 24th. That's in two weeks on Thursday. Our next general SharePoint dev uh, meeting will be in one week 
on October 17th. Uh, so that'll be next Thursday. Uh, we will have uh, the next general SharePoint development uh, special interest group. So thank you, everybody, for joining the call. Uh, learn, reuse, and share. Appreciate everybody's time, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.